In this video, we're gonna break down every single crested gecko morph that we have. So a morph is basically just the phenotype or the visual representation of its genetics that the animal is displaying. So this is an axanthic crested gecko and this is an extreme harlequin lily white. Same species of geckos, but their patterns and their colors are gonna be dictated by the traits that they express. There are three basic starter morphs that we're gonna talk about. The first one being the patternless or like this gecko here, a buckskin. A buckskin is basically what we call a brown or a tan uh, crested gecko that is patternless, doesn't have much going on, but this is typically how you would find them in the wild. This guy here, this is a tiger. This is another one of the base morphs I was talking about. And a tiger is similar to a patternless, except they will have streaks of vertical pattern going down. Now, honestly, this guy doesn't have as much tiger patterning as I, I would like, but you could see that there are lines of basically darker pattern that are going down and breaking up his body here and their vertical patterning going down. Tigers are typically yellow, but there are other colors of tigers like orange tigers. And the tiger, the tiger gene basically can express itself in different ways. This next base morph is called a flame. Now a flame will have a base coloration and different colored markings. Usually they're orange or white or yellow that go on the top. Now the flames may have a little bit of side markings or on their legs, but for the most part, it's just gonna be on the top and that is what makes them up a flame. Now flames, they could come in red, they could come in dark base colors, yellow base colors. So what we're talking about here is basically the different base to marking coloration. That's what makes it a flame. Now this next morph is basically an upgraded flame. It is the flame pattern that it has down the back but it has a lot of lateral and limb pattern. So it's a flame with side pattern and leg pattern. That is a harlequin. Now harlequins, like a, a lot of the other morphs, their base color can, can change. You know, this girl is a red harlequin. There could be black harlequins, there could be yellow harlequins, but this one in particular is a red harlequin. Now you could see there's just yellow markings on top, the sides, and the base color that's that like that red coloration that is in the background. And that's what makes up a Harlequin. Now this gecko here is a tricolor Harlequin. It's similar like the previous girl we just showed you, but there is the orange markings, the cream markings, and the dark base color on this gecko. So three colors, that's why they're called tricolors. This is more of a designer morph and it's very sought after. So this guy here is a extreme harlequin and he's actually high white as well but an extreme harlequin is just an exaggerated version of a regular harlequin the lateral markings are going to creep up almost touching the dorsal and sometimes they even do touch the dorsal so the more markings like white or orange harlequin markings that the animal has the more desirable that what makes it an extreme harlequin now this next morph is very popular and it's another morph that a lot of people use in their projects and they combine with other traits. This is a pinstripe. Now the pinstripes have, you see these crests, these spikes that they have on the crest, they will continue down all the way down throughout their body, all the way down to the base tail. Um, now that is what makes up a pinstripe. A pinstripe is just that, you know, the, the pinstripe scales, the scales that go all the way from the back to the tail base. That's what makes up a pinstripe. There are two things. There's when the when there's no break in the scales, that's called a full pinstripe. When there is a break in the scales, it's called a partial pinstripe. This guy is close to being a full pinstripe, but you can see there's a little break in the scales there. He's missing like two little pinstripe scales. So technically he is a partial pinstripe. So the next step after a pinstripe would be a quad stripe. A quad stripe is basically a pinstripe that has two lateral lines like this guy here, one on this side and one on this side. You see what the pinstripe does a lot of the time is it forces the markings on the sides to make a lateral pattern, a horizontal pattern. 
and that's why they get these stripes on the side. Some pinstripes will have the Harlequin markings that come up, so it just depends on if they have tiger influence, if they have a lot of Harlequin influence, or if they have more pinstripe influence, what's gonna determine how their laterals look. But you can see on this guy, I mean, he has the pinstripe scales running down the back, and then he has the two lateral stripes that make perfect stripes on both sides. For it to be a quad stripe, it has to have two perfect lateral sides like this guy. Okay, so the next evolution of a pinstripe and a quad stripe, this super stripe. Now the super stripe is basically a quad stripe with a mid dorsal line going down his back. This is what makes a super stripe. If it has a perfect line going down its back, he's also a white wall, but we'll get to that later. These guys are a little bit harder to produce or not as common at all. And they just have a very clean look that I absolutely love. Now this is a phantom pinstripe. Now phantom is a recessive mutation that will basically make the animal patternless. A lot of people think that patternless, all patternless are basically phantoms and all phantoms are basically patternless. But just for the sake of this video, we're gonna keep them separate. So this is a phantom pinstripe and a phantom doesn't necessarily have to have pinstripe scales but this one you could see that it is muted of all the color that's what makes it a phantom it basically gets one solid coloration all throughout the body but it still keeps those pinstripe scales that we usually see put together with like the harlequin or the flame markings and as you could see this guy he's just super dark phantoms could come in red they could come in olive or dark they could come in yellow. Yellow is typically one of the most uh, like one of the most common phantoms that are that are going to pop up are yellow phantom pinstripes. But this is one of the variations. Now this is an example of what the tangerine pigment does on a black base gecko. It basically makes it bright orange markings instead of like a yellow or instead of like a white. It makes them bright orange and they absolutely look killer on these black base geckos. So this is kind of like a combination morph. This is what we would call kind of like a creamsicle. And a creamsicle basically is an orange background and bright yellow or tangerine markings on the top or on the sides. The tangerine gene is something that is influences the markings on top and on the on the sides the harlequin markings essentially and it makes it basically brings out a bright yellow coloration on them it could be bright yellow or bright orange it expresses differently depending on the type of animal so in an animal like this that's a red base take technically that is uh, like an orange a light orange to a pink coloration the way the tangerine expresses itself is by being brighter yellow on the sides it's kind of like a highlight basically so this gecko here is interesting because there's a lot of phenotypes, a lot of visual geckos that look similar to this, but there's a lot of debate on what they could be. So some people call these charcoals or, you know, a dark phantom. I think it's a dark phantom. So the difference between a charcoal and a dark phantom would be that the charcoals allegedly, I don't know, I have never produced them. But from my understanding, they're co-dominant. So you only need one charcoal to produce charcoals. With the phantoms, it's kind of like a recessive trait. So if you breed this guy to a normal girl, all the geckos are going to come out normal, but they're all going to carry the phantom gene. But this guy, this is actually his first breeding season here. Um, so far, all his babies look normal, so I'm leaning towards a phantom. But the cool thing about these guys is just the amount of melanin that they have. They're a very dark gecko, so if you like really dark geckos, go for one of these. Now this gecko here is a combination of a lot of different traits, but the reason I'm showing you is because I want to highlight the white wall trait. The white wall is basically something that attaches itself to the Harlequin side markings, and it makes a solid cream or white marking down the sides. Now you could see this guy, it's so thick, it's, it's hard to explain just by showing him, but what I love about these is it's just, it's like very filled up. It's all the side is filled up with that cream coloration and it just gives it like a, I don't know, just a really cool look that I, th these are honestly some of my favorites because they tend to like, 
the color tends to last longer than like regular Harlequin markings. So when you start stacking up that white wall and that cream on top of each other, it forms this thick markings that I just love. One more thing that this guy has is the white spot or a snowflake trait. And the, they're basically, they almost look like Dalmatian spots, but they tend to be towards the back legs and towards the sides of the animal. And they will also drip from the top of the dorsal towards the bottom. And it's just s small little white spots that you could see throughout his body, which are just give the animal that much of a better look, in my opinion. So this next trait is called a Dalmatian. It's very popular and it's self-explanatory. All those little spots like the Dalmatian dogs, that's what makes it a Dalmatian. Now this girl actually has a good amount of spotting, but a Dalmatian, all it needs is one spot and it's considered a Dalmatian technically. Dalmatians spread pretty easily. They're like a co-dominant mutation, so our, our co-dominant trait, I should say. As long as I breed this girl, to a regular um, regular animal, about half the offspring are gonna have Dalmatian spots. And if I breed two Dalmatians together, one in four offspring are gonna be super Dalmatian. So this here is a super Dalmatian, and as you can see, it has a higher amount of spots. They tend to have bigger spots. Some will just have a high amount of small spots, but either way, it's considered a super Dalmatian. Now, Super Dalmatians and Dalmatians, they can come in a variety of colors and patterns. They could be yellow base, they could be red base, they could be brown, and they could also, the Dalmatian spots can go onto pinstripes or harlequins or basically any other trait. It's an independent trait, so whatever you breed a Dalmatian to, it's gonna pass it on to, you know, any morph that you breed it to. So what happens when you breed two Super Dalmatians together? You get more Super Dalmatians, but the amount of spots increase. And I'm gonna show you that now. And this is what you get when you put two Super Dalmatians together. You get more Super Dalmatians, but just a higher amount of spotting. Now this is Chester. He's probably my animal that has the most spots. He is an incredible breeder, but I just wanted to show you how far you could go when you start stacking the traits on top of each other. They just keep getting better and better and better. Now this next morph is my all-time favorite. This is a Lily White. And the Lily Whites, the laterals actually pr seem pretty similar to the white walls, but it just adds so much more pattern and color. And it's so variable. It does crazy things with all the different morphs that you pair it to. And these guys are a co-dominant trait. So what that means is basically that you only need one Lily White, you pair it up to a normal gecko and you're gonna get about half the offspring are gonna display that gene. It's a heterozygous visual of the phenotype. So basically, if you see the trait on the animal, the animal carries the gene. If you don't see the trait on the animal, the animal doesn't carry the, the gene. So this is, like I said, it's the, the best thing that's happened to crested geckos in my opinion because of the explosion of different morphs and colors that it's brought with them. And this is like a pretty uh, standard lily white. You know, a lot of lily whites will have that solid dorsal of cream or white. The, obviously the white wall looking sides on, the, on, on both laterals. So this is an example of what the lily white gene can do. This one here, this is my girl Blood Orchid and she is a tricolor red lily white. And this is my boy Frost and he is an extreme Harlequin high expression lily white. I mean, the colors just pop on these animals. And if you just have a regular tricolor red Harlequin, it's not gonna pop as much as a lily white red tricolor. So this is why I love this morph so much and I think it's literally the best morph that could happen to crested geckos. And this last morph I have in my hands is called an Azantic. This is a very popular gene and it's another gene that just blew up the crested gecko market. And the Azantic is a recessive trait that will basically take away the yellow pigmentation of any animal. And that's why you get these bright white colors. There's no cream, it's bright white on the pinstriping here, on the tail base and on the sides. And now, honestly, the coolest thing about the Azantics in my opinion is that they could be pitch black. They could be basically like a black and white gecko, especially when you pair them up with a lily white. These guys are another really cool morph, I think. Um, there's a lot of variability with them. 
this girl tends to she's kind of browning out a little bit but i've seen Azantics that will stay that that will be fully gray or really dark um dark gray and i've seen some that look almost jet black so the the combinations when you start putting all these animals together that's what's really interesting what we could do and that's why these morphs are just you know starting to keep growing and growing because we just you know All right, guys, that's my rundown on some of these crested gecko morphs. There are a couple other morphs out there. Maybe we'll finish in a second video, but that's it for now. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't already. We're trying to get to 100,000 followers here on YouTube, and we need your help to do that. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on the next one.